on behalf of myself and one of my favorite uh, ecology professors in college, Dr. Craig Spencer, I welcome you to this video in which we learn about relationships that exist between organisms and ecosystems. I think we can learn about these a lot through examples. Here's one. This is Flathead Lake in Montana. Uh, Dr. Craig Spencer did a lot of research in that area to figure out why something happened. Uh, this is a kokanee uh, salmon. Kokanee salmon. Uh, it's a really cool fish. Uh, supposedly it's wonderful to fish for. This gives you a look at uh, the different fish species and zooplankton and phytoplankton that lived in this beautiful lake in Montana uh, in the middle of the 1980s. This is an organism that uh, Montana Wildlife and Fish decided let's introduce this opossum shrimp into this lake so that we can boost the population of kokanee salmon a very prized and sought after fish of all fishermen in the country and Canada. So what happened? They expected, as had happened in another lake in Canada, that the kokanee salmon would uh, not only survive but reproduce and just really thrive in that environment where kokanee or where this opossum salmon lived. Here's a look at what actually happened. It didn't work. Oops. Sometimes our what we think will happen, there are unintended consequences to the things that humans do. In this case, they actually wiped out the kokanee salmon population. No longer existed. Why? It's complicated. Uh, maybe I can get to that at the end of this video. But this is going to be about relationships between organisms in the ecosystem and let's get to it. Each organism that lives in a certain area or habitat is going to have a certain niche that it that it follows. Uh, you can think about your niche in your environment. Uh, where do you stand in your family? Uh, where uh, do you stand at this school uh, and in your community? Sometimes I think my niche during a Minnesota winter should be somewhere warmer. Wouldn't I live and thrive and do a lot better in a warmer place? But then I forget, no. Yeah, I, I would like warmer weather. However, I've got some pretty awesome students here. I've got a lot of special people and family living nearby. There's no way I'd be dumb to live anywhere else. Well, animals do that too. So do plants. There are areas where they can survive and grow and reproduce and find their niche. And it might be different than the other organisms around it. And if it isn't, you've got to compete for that spot. I might use the word niche once in a while to describe uh, an organism's place in that ecosystem and what it provides for other organisms within that ecosystem and how it uh, provides itself with the energy it needs to survive, grow, and reproduce. Here are some common terms uh, that you might come across when we talk about ecological things happening. One involves the relationships around food, like what they consume or produce. Producers are those organisms that can do photosynthesis. They provide food for consumers to eat. Consumers do exactly that. They consume things in their environment. They eat in order to get the energy that they need. Decomposers take, uh, in most cases, dead, uh, formerly living material and break that down to get the energy that it needs to survive. Many fungi would fall into this category of decomposers those that uh, do a very good job of recycling nutrients so that these producers can do well. And so the balance of producers, consumers, and decomposers in any ecosystem or community of organisms is something that we should be familiar with. You might also uh, see terms that describe what other organisms eat. 
So if they are consumers, what kind of consumer are they? Are they those that only feed on producers, on plants? Such a, those are called herbivores if they feed on plants. Carnivores uh, feed on things that eat plants or other things that eat other things that eat plants. Carnivores eat meat. And if the animal has a wide variety in their diet, uh, they are called omnivores. They are omnivorous. They can eat both plants and animals. It depends on what is available in the environment. This slide is all about symbiosis. It's how different species interact very closely with each other, in ter even in terms of getting their energy. They need, uh, in some cases, to live amongst or inside or outside of another organism of a different species. I'll describe three different forms of symbiosis, how these animals interact with each other, uh, that are on this slide right here. The first is called mutualism. Uh, the symbol that describes mutualism for both species involved is plus and plus. In other words, they benefit they both benefit each other. They help each other out. Examples include the termites and the enzymes that live inside their digestive tracts. Uh, these bacterial enzymes actually allow the termites to digest wood better so that they can get that energy. The enzymes benefit also. Uh, they get a food source and they get a, a safe place to live inside the digestive tract of the uh, termites. Another example of mutualism would include the mycorrhiza that grows along the uh, roots of uh, grasses and trees. Uh, with mycorrhiza, the, the grass really thrives uh, because the mycorrhiza allows it to get nutrients and water much more effectively. The mycorrhiza also benefits from the association with plants in its way and method of getting food for itself. Uh, so it's a win-win. Mutualism is a win-win. Conversely, parasitism is not win-win. It's win-lose. One species benefits from the presence uh, or interaction of these two organisms, and the other is hindered. It's not helped, but hindered. It hurts. Okay. An example of parasitism with our own bodies is strep throat. That is caused by a bacteria that benefits from having a source of food inside our bodies uh, and a place to live. Uh, we are obviously not helped when we get strep throat and we want to get rid of it as soon as we can. Um, so we are hurt, the bacteria is helped, and that is called parasitism. The other example pictured is the this dog that has mites or ticks or fleas. Those uh, organisms would benefit from living uh, on the skin and hair of the dog, but the dog isn't benefited at all. In fact, it's hurt, and uh, it's not a pleasant experience for those dogs to have those mites and ticks and fleas. The other one to describe another form of symbiosis, uh, this one is called commensalism. This is not a plus or a minus. Uh, it's not a plus and plus. This is plus and meh. It's kind of like indifferent. Uh, for example, I think this is the best way to, to see this. Uh, barnacles that live uh, on the skin of gray whales. The gray whale is like, yeah, go ahead. Live there if you want to. You're not really helping me. You're not exactly hurting me either. Now, meanwhile, the barnacles get a free ride across the ocean to find all the food and the nutrient-rich water uh, that they can find is because the blue or the gray whale brings it through that nutrient-rich water. That's a good deal for them. The deal for the whale is pretty indifferent. The second example of commensalism includes a certain bird species that follows deer around. Uh, the deer do a good job of eating grass. That's how they get their energy. And in doing so, they kind of invigorate the organisms that live right at the surface and reveal a lot of bugs and other organisms that the bird can feed on. 
this doesn't really help the deer all that much to have this relationship. Uh, maybe it likes the company, maybe it doesn't. It really doesn't matter to the deer, but to the bird, it, it's a means of survival. The deer help it find food. Uh, so that's another example of commensalism, where you have one species benefiting a lot and one that really doesn't care. Another relationship between organisms that one might think of is the relationship of predator and prey. The predator does the hunting, the eating, uh, the killing, and the prey is trying to get away from that predator. Uh, there are so many adaptations that are selected for out in the wild uh, that come from this kind of relationship. Predators such as the wolf uh, gain speed. Uh, their their teeth are sharp and they hunt in a group. Those are all adaptations that predators can obtain. Meanwhile, the pronghorn antelope that is being hunted uh, is also in this arms race, trying to defend itself. It's an amazingly agile creature and incredibly fast, the fastest animal in North America. Uh, you might see other prey, such as a frog, uh, disguise itself very well. Uh, it can be predator at times to hunt for bugs and then prey at some times and the camouflage really helps it uh, survive in the wild. Rattlesnakes uh, such as this one pictured have an amazing ability to find uh, prey, potential prey, and can even sense heat to do so. An eagle has an amazing uh, sense of sight to find even the smallest forms of prey and then sharp talons to snatch that prey and the ability to fly isn't so bad either. Buffalo uh, or bison have learned how to stay safe in groups. When they travel in groups they're much more uh, or much less susceptible to predation from another animal trying to attack it. The coral snake has some intense coloration that sends a warning out to potential predators, don't eat me unless you want a body full of venom. So all of these adaptations arise from that relationship of predator and prey. There's so many relationships to speak of in any food web that you might find and we'll learn more about those later. Um, but hopefully those terms that you've learned about in this video uh, will be beneficial to you as you study more in depth the ecosystems in our world. Finally, uh, back to our first example. Why did the kokanee salmon disappear? I thought it was supposed to thrive when the opossum shrimp was added to it. This is what it looks like th only three years later after the introduction of that opossum shrimp. Well here's what happened. All of the zooplankton that used to be a great food source for the fish in the middle of the 1980s uh, were hunted down by the opossum shrimp. The opossum shrimp went to different depths. All of these zooplankton lived in different depths and they all had their own niche. The opossum shrimp took those away. Phytoplankton thrived. This whitefish tuna, which used to be a bottom feeder, started feeding on the opossum shrimp. And not only that, since the opossum shrimp lived at different depths, the whitefish uh, trout began to venture through not only hanging out at the bottom of the lake but also at the parts of the lake where the kokanee salmon were. The whitefish trout killed uh, by predation uh, a lot of the kokanee salmon to the point that in the later half of the 1980s the kokanee salmon disappeared. Did they know that was going to happen? No. It was an unintended consequence of some action uh, that the wildlife and fish uh, department of Montana did not see coming. Uh, so that's only one of many stories. Maybe you can find your own uh, story that displays the interactions of organisms in an ecosystem.